<laughs> Welcome everyone um, and thank you for coming to this workshop. It's a collaboration between PLANT, which is people learning about nature in Tayport. Tayport Community Trust um, is PLANT is part of Tayport Community Trust, Nine Wells Community Garden, Strathcanis Community Garden and Yellow Wellies Gardening. We've been running these workshops um, throughout lockdown. Uh, this workshop is funded by the Climate Challenge Fund, which is uh, provided by the Scottish Government, the Robertson Trust, the Ganicky Trust and the Community Lottery Fund. I'm Helena. Uh, I work at Nine Wells Community Garden. Bob is Bob Bilson from Tapo, uh, sorry, Strathkinnis Community Garden is going to be doing the presentation today, which will last about 20 minutes and then we'll all have time to ask some questions. OK, over to you, Bob. Yeah, th thanks, Helena, and uh, welcome everyone to Swathkinis, which is um, a small village just outside of uh, St Andrews. So obviously we're on the east coast of um, east coast of Scotland, and um, we've got a lovely day here. And in fact, this morning I was working up in our community garden um, in the orchard. I was doing some pruning. Um, we're not going to be talking much about anything about pruning today because next month I believe we have a, another workshop just on pruning. So um, that's just to give you a little bit of a heads up on that one. Um, um, yes, so I was doing some pruning this morning. Normally we, we do this as a group activity, but with the restrictions obviously we have at the moment, um, that's not possible. Last year we actually had the village cub pack with us, um, with their uh, a few helpers and parents doing the pruning. So uh, it's a great way having a community garden or orchard to get um, get uh, well get young people and people of all ages involved. And um, okay, many of you will have your own garden, but irrespective of that, it you may not have any garden at all. You can grow fruit on a balcony in a pot, there's no, no difficulty there. And, but a good way if you really want to sort of um, learn and contribute is to join a local um, community group. It's a little bit difficult this year, uh, sorry, at the moment, but um, hopefully a lot more possible in the not too distant future. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a great way of um, uh, of learning a little bit about um, certainly about fruit, fruit and fruit growing. Um, yeah, but the Cub Pack did a lot of work with us right way through the year. They had a project on food and fruit, and uh, they helped us um, uh, fertilize the fruit trees, the fruit bushes, and also they helped on the um, apple day that we had. They picked the fruit and helped wash it before it was put through the, the juicer. Um, I've been actually growing fruit in various locations for the last over 50 years now. Um, that's both in England and in Scotland, mainly on the East Coast. I'm involved in, a, in five orchards on the East Coast of Scot Scotland. But I've also got um, a connection with um, a West Coast orchard on the Isle of Butte, which is a really... Uh, really interesting very very different growing fruit on the west coast to the east coast the rainfall for instance is um about three times higher i noticed someone um in in our workshop today is from shetland and obviously that would be a quite a challenging environment for growing well for growing out any fruit although i did visit shetland couple of years ago and and it's amazing what you can do if you have the right shelter in place so we'll talk about that later okay so why should we want to grow food um in our own gardens well um we import 90 percent of food um in the uk we import it from other countries so if we can grow it ourselves that's that's Got it, it, that must be a good thing. And if we can grow it organically, that's even better. Um, I have some information from the Soil Association. Apparently, the average number of spray um, occasions per year on a commercial orchard is more than 20. 
So there's all these fungicides and herbicides that uh, go in, unfortunately, go into um, the lovely shiny fruit that we buy from our shops and supermarkets. Okay, some of our fruit might not be quite as pretty as that, but um, um, I think that's the sort of fruit I'd, I'd, I'd like to grow. The last time we were actually in Strathkinis was back in April when we had a look around the, um, the orchard and it was in bloom at the time. And you can access that video if you want. Um, we've got a collection of all, all, all our recorded programs. Um, but what I would want to do now is show a, a short 67, 60 second video of our orchard in August, towards the end of August when we were uh, picking fruit. So maybe Helen, if you could show that video, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thanks, Helena. Okay, are we? Um, okay, well, uh, yeah, that that orchard um, in Strathkinnis there, it's got about sixty apples, pears, and plum trees in it, and um, it was planted um, ten years ago. So it's really quite productive now. We get quite many tons of fruit each year. Um, we have fruit growing right way through the season, so some of it picks early, some later, some we use for juicing, some stores really well. Um, it's, uh, as I say, it, it, it's extremely productive. J just a very quick word about um, fruit in Scotland. We, we're very fortunate in that um, here we are a world centre for soft fruit breeding through the Hutton Institute, where they've developed all sorts of fruit, in particularly the, um, the raspberries that you'll, you'll see, uh, different Glen names, Glen Cross and Glen Ample. Um, uh, Hutton Institute is in just outside Dundee and also in Aberdeen. Um, in Fife, actually, there are 174 orchards recorded. Um, you can, we'll, we'll give you a reference, but there's um, orchardrevival.org. We'll, we'll, we'll give you all these references um, um, as attachments, which is part of the National Orchard Inventory for Scotland. So Fife has 174 um, orchards. Other parts of um, Scotland have, have, have even more. Um, Interestingly enough, there are probably lots more orchards than that, because by definition of this uh, particular group, you only need five trees in your garden and you can register it as an orchard. So that, that's quite interesting. In Dundee, for instance, there was a project a few years ago and there were 25 urban orchards in, in, in Dundee. Um, which uh, is an opportunity for people to learn about growing fruit there. Okay, um, we've only got 20 minutes, but um, I want to show you a little bit of reference material now that will be available for, to you. Um, this is a, a planting plan, the orchard plan for Strathkinis, and you'll be able to see all the different types of apples, we grow and it also gives you 
the uses of them, whether they're good for juicing or storing, etc. Um, there's some really good old uh, Scottish varieties here as well, with great names like uh, Bloody Ploughman and Beauty of Moray, uh, Tower of Glams. And um, yeah, some of these date back to um, the 1700s and 1800s. Um, I mentioned about the orchard at Kilcutton Kilk Bay on the Isle of Butte, and we have a similar orchard plan there. So um, this will be available to you. Um, other useful information, there's a really good book that we'll give you a reference to called Pruning and Training by the uh, Royal Horticultural Society. This is a battered sort of 40 year old there's more up-to-date editions than that, but that uh, is a good um, reference, really, to talk about pruning and training of all sorts of things, but particularly food. Um, there's another brilliant book here from um, the Kenneth Cox of the Cox family at Glendoyck Nursery and Garden Centre called Fruit and Vegetables for Scotland. That's well worth... Um, a look and um, I must show you this particular page here um, there's a photo I don't know if you go. that is Willie Duncan I'm not sure if you can see him he's the absolute uh, guru of fruit growing in certainly in Fife and probably the whole of Scotland and um, there's a photo of him there on an apple day I think it might be one of the botanic gardens in St Andrews that uh, I've been to a few times and I've learned a lot from uh, him and a, a few other people. There's also a Facebook group called Orchard Collective Scotland that you can join and people are very free with their information there. Also a couple of the Scottish fruit growers are there. Um, so that's a bit about reference material. Just while I'm here showing things, um, just to show you that is some uh, apple juice produced on the Isle of Butte. They've got a, um, an organisation called Juicy Butte. And that is a single apple source. It's called Sunset. So that particular apple, Sunset, gives you a lovely pale golden apple juice. Um, in fact, the, the apple juice in Strathkinis was, um, we just mixed all the apples together. But in... On the Isle of Butte, they actually did it really, really carefully. And you have mixtures of apples, but they also, um, um, they actually had some lovely red ones from the Discovery apples and another apple called Red Devil. It gives you a lovely pink apple juice. Okay, there's another man in the village in Strathkinis here who actually makes cider with his apples. So... There's some of this. Uh, I'm drinking the apple juice now. I'll have the cider a little bit later. Good job. You right. it the other way around. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. OK, so um, maybe we can go on to have a look at some of the um, photos now, which will take us into some of the soft fruit that we can grow. So, Helena, if you could show the first photo, that would be great. Okay. Right. So this is one of the apple trees in Strathkinis, and um, it 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 shows that a slightly different form of training apple tree trees, which will be in that book I referred to, the RHS book, and that is called that is by um, a spindle training, which is how they actually um, train apples in very, very small spaces. So it would be good for a small garden. And that's how they do it commercially. And you can get a huge amount of apples from a, a, a small space there. Other places to see that form of training are the St Andrews Botanic Gardens. Um, we've got some in Cooper at their flower and blossom with fab orchard just down from the fire station in Cooper. And also, if, if you go to Schoon, Schoon Palace with Brian Cullinan, the 
guy um, um, who's on Beach Grove. Um, he's got a whole wall garden trained with that style of tree. So uh, that's a really useful one. Could, could maybe put the next one on, Helena? Sure. Okay, th this shows the sort of apples you can get. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see where some of the branches have been pulled down. I don't know whether you can see that very well. I'm expanding it out here. And there's some, there, there's some actually rubber tubing that pulls the branches down. And that's a great way of getting apples to fruit when the branches are sticking up in the air vertically. They don't fruit so well. If you can pull them down, but you'd only do that in the summer. Don't do it in the winter, you'll snap the branches. But if you can pull some of your branches down, that's a great way to get turn the growth um, shoots on, on apple trees and pear trees as well, and plum trees, into fruiting, blossoming and fruiting ones. Uh, thanks, Helena. Could you show the next one, please? Okay, well, that's an interesting tree. It's a jardinelle pear. Now, the jardinelle pear, if I just check my plants here, I, that's a really old pear tree from 1629 uh, was first uh, developed. And that actually fruited. Pears are quite difficult, I've found, in, in some parts of Scotland. You need a lot of shelter for them. And... Um, but the jardinelle pear is naturally branch. Uh, the branches droop naturally, and and so you get so much more blossom. And that is actually loaded with fruit, but is ready to pick from a tree in August. So jardinelle, it'll be on that um, um, chart that I I, I showed earlier, uh, along with all the other varieties that do well in different parts of Scotland. Okay, Helen, the next one, please. Okay, so we're going on to some, um, at the bottom of our community garden orchard, we have a what we call a habitat section, which is more like a forest garden. And um, these trees were given to us by the RHS 10 years ago. And that is a, a cherry plum. So we have a lot of wild fruit in there. We've got sloes. Um, hazelnuts, cherry plums, elder, uh, and they form a small section of, um, well, we had about 200 in there, actually, of um, um, permaculture forest garden, which uh, works uh, quite well, very good for wildlife as well. Okay, Helen, if you can show the next one. Thank you. Okay, well, this is a quince, and you can grow quince. Um, normally, you'd see the shrubby quince, that were the, the japonica quince, but this is an actual quince tree, which is only about seven years old, but it's actually full of fruit now. That one is called Serbia Gold. It's on the plan that um, I have, and that's really, really good. If you put a few of those in with the apple juice, it just, just makes it uh, very, very good. So quince are very, very good to grow um, in your garden. Um, okay, next one, Helena. Okay, and we're coming on to some of the soft fruit now. Um, we've got, uh, uh, the thing about the soft fruit is you really have to protect a lot of it from birds, um, certainly raspberries. Um, that is uh, Glen Ample, Glen Moy we have, which is uh, our summer, summer varieties. Um, we have autumn ones as well. Um, Polka, Joan Jay, um, and yeah, but uh, some of those were developed, as I said, by the Hutton Institute. Um, very, very good to grow in the east of Scotland. Certainly, we we we've got ideal conditions for growing soft fruit, as you probably know, and a lot of it um, is grown commercially here. Okay, Helen, if you can. Other one. Okay, well, this is an interesting one because it's a gooseberry, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but we've grown it as a vertical cordon. Now, if you visit the um, um, the National Trust of Scotland garden at um, oh, forgot my place. Anyone help me near near the coast, Anstruther? Um, Sorry, Bob, can't uh, think of anything. <laughs> not not Hilletar, but the other one. Oh, it's just gone now, anyhow, but uh, it'll come back to me. Um, 
but there they um as here we we grow them as vertical cordons and um we um they're much easier to pick and you don't get all the thorns and they're higher up and it's much easier easier to pick you can grow uh gooseberries red currants and white currants like that uh, black currants you you do a little bit differently. You have those uh, uh, branching bushes from the, the, the ground. You also get really big gooseberries growing them that that uh, that way. Um, oh, sorry, I just remembered where they do these. They've been doing them for decades. So I'm at Kelly Castle um, on the coast there. Okay, Helena, look at the next one. Okay, some slightly different fruit here. This is a Japanese wine berry, which is really, really, well, um, I, I think it's delicious. Um, it's very, very easy to grow. You just grow it like a bramble. Um, you just tie the shoots in. We just have it on our fence that we try and keep the rabbits out of the community garden in. And um, that's, a, that's a really nice one to grow. Um, and, oh, yeah, I did mention in the initial notes that um, we grow you can we do grow some of our fruit in a polytunnel and these are a grape called Bosco giant but we grow in our polytunnel um we didn't have a very good year last year because we had some awful weather in may that um actually nipped all the blossom even though it's in a polytunnel but normally we get from this just one grapevine we get about 40 kilos from one vine um, also in that polytunnel, we have a fig, brown turkey fig, but it's fruiting really well. It's only three years old. Um, you can, if, if you give the right conditions and shelter, you can grow figs outside on a, on a, uh, on a wall. Um, I think that's, um, that finishes the, um, some of the slides, but there is plenty more fruit you can grow um certainly cherries are really really good to grow in um certainly in eastern scotland we grow a lot of them in our fruit cage birds particularly with blackbirds um you have to net them they'll just take them um uh, red currants um uh what else we got here oh we don't actually have any blueberries in our in our fruit garden but um they're good to grow you have to have a quite a an acid um growing um soil so um you need you need a low ph so pine needles are, are, are needed there and um but we grow something called a saskatoon which is very very similar to a blueberry and, and it's easier to grow so maybe that's uh, that's worth it worth a try um strawberries we grow we put um we we dig some up and actually put them in our greenhouse as well um right okay i'm gonna just spend a couple of minutes before we stop uh, because we want to uh, have the time for questions um about what conditions we need to grow some of our fruit particularly those people who are in shetland or on the west coast uh, of, uh, sorry, on the west of Scotland, you do need a sheltered site, definitely. Um, the Isle of Butte orchard that we made, we planted a row of older, older trees which grow really rapidly. We planted them about three metres apart and they've given us a windbreak. Remember, this orchard is right near to the coast as well and it gets salt spray on it. Um, if you have good shelter and you have say even a wall in your sheltered spot you can grow some amazing fruit if you go to castle fraser up in um, a national trust garden near aberdeen they actually grow in august um ripe peaches the, the wall is actually covered in ripe peaches just a south facing uh brick wall so it just shows you what you can do if you can put the shelter in there before you do anything else try and have some shelter by hedges um screens uh anything you can think of there um the the, the soil that you're growing in is quite important as well fruit grows in a slightly acid soil which we 
have in Scotland in many places. Anything from a pH of five and a half to just over seven would be would be good. Also, make sure that the ground is not too compacted and it, and it grows, it drains freely. Now, when we first started the Strathkinnis orchard, um, we didn't realise we had a really wet spot towards the bottom of the orchard. And we, we planted plum trees there, and that really was a mistake. And we've had to move any plum trees to the top, which drains much better. Well, apples would, will go okay in uh, slightly wetter conditions but um, plums no they they really want good draining soil um i think i think it's a good point to stop because we've got 20 minutes left and um and maybe it's a good point to start asking some questions yeah um i've actually asked a lot of questions here <laughs> but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take them at the end if we've got time um so uh, the first question that wasn't from me was from Trisha. Would you like to ask that one? You'll yeah, I, I, uh, un I see yep. Trisha's question. Do you need a particular we, variety if we, of if, yeah, if we, yeah, if we let sure. Trisha ask it out loud, that's quite good for the recording. Yeah, so currently I've got small, very prickly gooseberry bushes and the idea of a cordon are a great, they're at a better height for picking, um, really appeals to me. And I wonder, do you need a particular type of a variety of gooseberry bush to do that, or can you do it with any variety? No, no, Tricia, you can do it with 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 anyone. And um, gooseberries are great because you can get them for free just by taking cuttings off um, off one that you know to be fruiting well. Um, there's some old varieties. There's one called Leveller, which is a nice um, yellow one. Um, there's some Japanese ones, um, which... Um, the uh, got, ones. Yeah, yeah, that, those, there's red ones and yellow ones and white ones of those. And mm -hmm. I've got those trained as cordons. But you can, to answer your question, you can use anything you want. And you prune them just uh, as a vertical cordon just to keep the side shoot short and then the uh, growth buds turn into fruit buds really really quickly and within a couple of years you you have a big column of gooseberries so it's it's a great way of growing them I always uh, think you do you do red currants and white currants just the same i always think they look a bit like christmas trees all right <laughs> um, they're, they're not uh, as wide uh, at the top <laughs> Sorry, as a Christmas tree. They look like they look a bit like a Christmas tree because you've got your, you know, your uh, long leader, and then and then they're growing slightly yeah. wider at the bottom. But they do go wide at the bottom, and also gooseberries sucker so easily, and then you have to actually dig out. We were doing one person was digging that out this morning and actually transplanting them into another position. So Excellent. so <laughs> it, it's really you, you don't need to buy many gooseberries you can just propagate them really easily okay thank you i've got um nicole has asked the next question about apple tree branches um if you unmute and you'd like to ask that one yourself hi yeah um our community garden has three apple trees I yeah. don't know how old they are, but they're quite large. They look nothing like your beautiful photograph. Right. Um, okay. So I'm really interested in how to pull down the branches with a rubber cord. Oh, right. Yeah, it's, it's more difficult to do once the trees get older. Right, I see. And um, But in that um, RHS book I was talking about, there's a section on renovating old trees. Um, and the, really the tip is don't, don't do it but don't do do it over a period of two three years yeah um just do parts of a tree at a time um if you do too much cutting on an old tree which is just lost it uh, you'll get all these water vertical water shoots which are just um n not productive um and yeah you i mean if you get some new growth you might be able to pull those down um, I didn't actually show, but um, um, I put a, like a vine eye into the tree stake, a little 
well, quite a strong vine eye, you know, one of these metal eyes. And then I pull the branches down in the summer, just do it in the summer, and tie the rubbery... Um, um, I mean, you, you can use twine or string even, but this the rubber is doesn't damage the bark too so so much and just you can just tie it into a tree stake okay. um and you can you can try that on maybe on some one or two two year old wood but your old wood no you're not going to be able to pull that down no, it's, it's just going to be so have a look at sort of on an old tree renovating it and mm -hmm. um yeah i went over to newborough I didn't mention new, but that's a famous part of um, Fife for fruit growing and um, um, learnt a little bit from the people there about renovating old trees. Okay, okay. yeah, I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah. So Nicole uh, did also ask, and I want to know the answer to this as well, what's the best time of year to do the pulling down of your branches? Yeah, to for pulling down, I do any time from the end of June, beginning of July, through to the end of August. Uh, that's when the sap is really up in the branches and they're more flexible and, and, you, and you, can do, you can do that there. Um, there's, um, uh, people may have heard of um, Apple Tree Man, Andrew Lear. Uh, that's a technique, actually, but I went on a a course a few years ago at Falkland at the Orchard there and he showed us uh, how to do that. Uh, it's a really useful technique. It's uh, Willie Duncan who I mentioned, he calls it festooning, which is a lovely word. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jane, do you want to just mention um, what you've... Oh, I wanted just to say about gooseberries. Hinemakis come from Finland, not Japan. And that's why they're, and obviously they're very hardy. Uh, and I have grown leveller, well, I was given leveller when I first started to grow fruit, and I always got powdery mildew. But I now have oh. Invicta. Invicta oh. is fine. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I, and the Hinamakis are fine as well. And, and I love the red one. It's a, delicious as a, a, just straight off the bush, you know, when it's ripe, gorgeous. So yep. this is this is a, my issue with gooseberries. Is always maybe you can help if you've uh, had a lot of experience with gooseberries. Um, obviously the sawfly larvae. Um, do you have? Does anyone have any top tips? I have had it, but I haven't had it for some time, as in several years now. Um, no is the answer. But <laughs> usually. The <laughs> I mean, they, usually the gooseberries recover. I mean, it doesn't knock them back permanently, in my experience. They're pretty right. tough, tough, tough beasts. <laughs> yeah, we, we've had quite a strong infestation, um, which I didn't keep on top of last year. So the bushes are looking, I didn't get much by way of gooseberries from it because there wasn't any leaves left to make any mm. uh, gooseberry. I think the advice is to, to clear up underneath them, isn't it? To, to make sure then that the things are hanging about in the soil underneath you know being yes. a bit idea than perhaps i i mean i'm a lazy gardener uh, but yeah. as i say I've for years <laughs> no I, I that appeals to me as well i'm always always seem to find something else that i could be doing <laughs> not not I mean, in the garden usually <laughs> but not picking up the um sawfly larvae <laughs> yeah we, we we haven't said i haven't said very much about pests and diseases but i mean there are organic um sprays that you use i don't tend to use them because even the organic ones they they sort of kill um they, they kill beneficial sort of insects and things i mean people who grow grapevines they they use um sulfur sulfur um fungicides that are permitted but uh, i sort of t tend to um not use any of these things and if you lose something one year, well, you know, usually there's, there's something else that uh, grows okay. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. On the sawfly thing, when I worked as a gardener, I did use a, a material, um, organic, um, um, biological material called dipel, which is a, um, a bacteria, bacillus. 
and and that does kill the um, the gooseberry sawflies really quickly. Um, I don't know whether it sort of kills other stuff. I haven't used used it in many years, but um, it is a uh, one of the organic things that you can use. Uh, uh, there's pyrethrum sprays as well, but I don't I don't like to use those. I mean, you can use those for raspberry beetle, but um, um, I think people with raspberries they can they sometimes use these sticky trap things. But again, um, we are, maybe we've been a little bit lucky in the stuff in his village, but we we really haven't had too much of a problem so far. So um, I'm, but, I'm going to ask you a really tricky question now, Bob. If you right. had, if you had limited space, yes. and you could only plant two things, assuming that you've got an uh, and somebody else has got an apple tree nearby, or anyone else has got something nearby that can pollinate, what would you plant? Um, what is, is this um, a a fruit tree rather than a soft fruit? Anything, anything. Would you would you go soft fruit or would you go tree or? Um, well, if you really got really restricted in space, I mean, I, I've never grown one, but some of these family trees might be worth a try, where you have uh, several different varieties um, grafted onto it. I mean, they are a bit expensive, and um, unless unless you actually um, did it yourself, did some grafting, which is not that difficult. Um, uh, I think I guess the other the good thing about a uh, a family tree with different varieties on is that um, uh, from a pollination point of view, which I haven't mentioned pollination, but in the charts I've got here, we've got different pollination groups where trees come into flower at different times. At least you've got the facility to cross pollinate the, um, the, um, uh, the, the apples. So you could have one of those. And then, um, I don't know. I, I, I really like red currants, so I might I might have a, a cordon red currant. So I've got an apple and um, and and a red currant. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'd choose. I, I, I was I knew that was a horrible question. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's fine. It's. Uh, um, I, I think we've got time for one more question. If anyone would like to, you can. I, I noticed what, there was one question earlier about um, propagating a, a Japanese wineberry. That was me, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you can do those really. If you know one who's, anyone who's got one, they 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 suck her. Um, you, you can do them from cuttings. And in fact, if you go to Strathkinish, you'll find every, <laughs> everyone's got one <laughs> off the original plant and it's all over the place. <laughs> Very easy. Okay, June's just asked one question. June, would you like to unmute and ask it? Hi, hiya, Bob. Um, if you Hi, were June. to, I've heard that you can graft um, apples onto another tree, uh, just uh, for maybe one or two or three or even four yeah. branches. If I'm wrong. Wh which ones would you? What one would you use as a mother tree to graft the other? And what other uh, apples would you graft onto? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I'll think about that for a second. Well, I'll um, tell you, I've got a family apple tree, which has got three grafts on, and it's got, it looks to me like it's um, got a rootstock. Um, then it's the Cox is the leader, and then it's got Katie and James Grieve on two branches. And that way they're all supposed, to, well, the Cox is supposed to pollinate the others and self-pollinate. So I guess you just have to make sure you've got your pollination bands um overlapping yeah yeah that that, that 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 would be good and i i think june what what i i do is we we had an interesting thing um when we got our cubs to pick the fruit um that's one point actually in this the coronavirus at the moment we, we we can involve children under 12 quite a lot so they were very very useful and uh, apart from them, they enjoyed it and hopefully learned something. But they, we did some apple tasting with the children. And the one they liked most was Katie, which is a Swedish apple. And the, one they, the next one they liked was Discovery. And they're both quite early apples. 
and um, I'd certainly have those two grafted on onto a tree. Excellent. Thanks Thank very you. much, Bob. Bob, that was okay. really true. Thank okay. you. Great. Now, if I could, it's five, we've got five more minutes. Um, I've just into the chat, I've just put in a form, which is our evaluation form. Um, if you could all click on that and fill that in, that's really helpful because we can provide this because we are funded to, to work and do these things. So we also have to write funding reports. Um, so if you can click on that form, um, and just fill that in. It shouldn't take more than about two, three minutes. Um, and then we can we can at least say that, look, we've got interaction. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I... And what I was going to suggest was for the last, uh, once once everyone's filled that form in, um, I'll leave this, the room open for a minute if anyone wants to stop and chat um, or I think of any last minute questions. Right. I, I've just noticed here that um, I think it's from Jane about the Hanumaika gooseberries. And <laughs> I said they were Japanese and they were from Finland. <laughs> That's they, good. Sound ja learned, they do sound I've, Japanese. I've, I've learned something. Sorry? <laughs> they sound like they should be from Japan. They, they certainly do, but they're from Finland. So yeah. we'll give some respect to Finland on that one. <laughs> my other my other question that I can, I'll just ask in the background while the forms are getting filled in um, the Waterstone Crook Community Garden has got deer um, and we're trying to you know use use um, chicken wire and things to, to stop them from chewing on everything other than well, the de sorry deer deer yeah Oh dear, yeah. Yeah, oh dear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> other than just growing plums, um, I was wondering if you had any advice other than maybe keeping on with the trying to protect them. Oh, on deer, yeah, deer. Are the real we've got deer as well, and um, yeah, they uh, um, on that Isle of Butte one, the deer are terrible. Um, they you certainly have to put on new trees trees you have to put um, at least 1.2 metre green tubes around them. Um, the road deer don't tend to graze high up. They actually go um, they go quite low down. If you've got branches within one and a half metres of the ground they'll, 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 they'll go there, there but they, they don't go much higher. Um, I'm just wondering about, you know um <clears throat> Some people have tried, gone along to the zoo and got li lion dung. <laughs> have you got that one? I, I don't have a handy zoo. <laughs> no. I've not, I, I didn't know that that worked. For, I thought that was for stopping cats. Um. Yeah, um, but there's a spray, which I tried at Teases, because we've got a lot of deer problems there. There's a spray, and I've forgotten the name of it, but it didn't work. Uh. Um uh, if you go to, yeah. Um, I was wondering about, if you could even grow a sacrifice plant or something that they would rather eat. Yeah, that that might. I mean, but they eat it. If they're hungry, they eat anything. They eat holly. They eat Ooh. mahonia. <laughs> <laughs> All the prickly things they eat. Wow. I don't know. Um, they, they're not meant to eat you. Tony Wilson, I had a real a chat with him once. He said, oh, they don't eat you. Yeah, they do eat you, <laughs> even though it might poison them. And um, what about um, what about um, human hair? Oh, if you yeah. get some hair from... Um, they don't like the smell of humans. Oh. So if you, tied, if you tied some bags, um, perforated bags of hair... Um, I, interestingly enough, I just got a big bag of um, sack full of hair from a dog groomer. Oh, yeah. Which is really high in nitrogen. I'm composting it at the moment. I'm having it as one component of our compost heap. Now, uh, dog hair, I mean, getting hair from hairdressers at the moment with the coronavirus is maybe not Ideal. brilliant. But dogs, dog hair, I think is okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't well, know. I'm, are you try? Are you going to try it? I do, I, I, 
Um, oh, well, I'm using the dog here for compost at the moment, but um, it might, it might, it might yeah. help for the. Um, there you go. In in Texas, in the U.S., uh, white-tailed deer are a severe problem with gardens. And one of the things that we use over there is garlic because they don't like the smell garlic, of garlic. Garlic, yeah. Oh. Mm. So I, I guess you could make a garlic spray. Would that be possible, Bob? Rob, so it's you, you, you can certainly could make garlic spray, yeah. That's garlic yeah. spray. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't wash away in the rain, though. Yeah. Um, Mm. Yeah, it, yeah. You have to apply it um, fairly regularly. I have used it. Um, I bought when I was gardener. I bought actually a um, two-gallon drum of it. <laughs> <laughs> Quite excessive because you dilute it down a lot. But I was using it a lot and had a lot of deer problems. And I think it might have he helped also. Um, what about growing wild garlic? Would that would that deter them? Yeah, it might do. It's worth any any of these things are worth a try. Uh, wild garlic they might eat though. No, no, okay, because it's not no. as strong. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. in 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 the end, at uh, at Teaser's estate, they ended up putting an electric fence around. <laughs> bit, <laughs> That'll work too. <laughs> it's a that's a bit excessive, isn't it? I, I, think, yeah, I think I think they don't like being in enclosed areas. I've noticed that the trees that are closer to where we've got um, there's like a a high raised bed and a compost heap, and they don't seem mm. to go into that area and browse so much there. And I think it might feel a little bit too enclosed for them. So I'm wondering if we just need to make it not be as attractive. Well, but, but another thing that I did was. Um... I got some, I put hammered, this was for rhododendrons, which the deer were absolutely murdering, and um, uh, yeah, rhododendrons. I put four stakes in, you know, one inch uh, square stakes, about um, one and a half meters tall, hammered four of those into the ground, and put some um, uh, netting around them so they just couldn't get near the plant. But I knew this is not easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you it's... just have to, have to try and, um, let's say, they, they don't graze too high. They don't raise their heads up. They keep their heads down and graze. And they don't eat plum trees, do they? Well, <sighs> it's a good question, but certainly rabbits don't. Um, and I don't think, I haven't had any problems with our plum trees with nibbling me. No, I, I think plums and cherries would be safe, but not apples. Okay. Uh, unless it was a really cold winter and then I said they eat anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Even garlic. <laughs> <laughs> okay.